If you're a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you're looking for ways to find deeply discounted properties before other real estate investors even know they exist, don't go anywhere because we're going to tell you exactly how that works. Well, welcome to the show. This is Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, uh, and this show is Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. Welcome to another episode. I've got joining me here on the show, my co-host, Chaffee Wynn from Chicago. So welcome, Chaffee. Oh, Jay, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Actually, uh, today, Chaffee, I'm uh, broadcasting from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where we've got a, a fantastic conference going on where I'm speaking and going on folks on a, uh, on a bus tour, which is different from my live event. We'll talk about that and talking about private money. So anyway, having a great time here. And so, you know, on the last episode of this show, Chaffee, we talked, we had some amazing questions from folks that attended our most recent live event. And on the uh, previous show, we went over, you went over some of those questions and I answered them again. And so I thought we'd do it again, Chaffee, uh, since we got such wonderful questions and uh, such an amazing response to the last show. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the benefits, obviously, of going to the boot camp is getting all these questions answered. And so it's great that we can actually discuss it on this podcast and get it out there for those that could not make it. And uh, obviously, if you can't, uh, did not make it the last one, make sure you make the one coming up in the future. <laughs> exactly. So for those of y'all that are new to the show, when we get through with this episode, you can go ahead and on over to check out on this website. We have our next upcoming live event right around the corner. And uh, here's the website. You can go check it out at www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. So that's Jay Conner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money podcast. And you can get all the details of what happens at this event. So um, Chaffee, I tell you what, why don't we go ahead and jump into some questions that we got to uh, ask at the live event. And if we got time on the show, we'll tell folks at the end, you know, a little bit more about the event. So uh, go ahead. Awesome. So uh, jumping right in, Jay, we talk a lot about finding private lenders at your boot camp, raising millions of dollars only. You know, can you tell the audience and the listeners, what's the benefit of being a private lender yourself? Why should you be a private lender? Or, you know, how can somebody convince somebody else that they should be a private lender? What's the benefit to them? Yeah. So I'm glad that question was asked at the live event because I work both sides of the business. Not only do I borrow uh, millions of dollars in private money, and by the way, folks, we're not talking hard money. We're talking doing business with individuals. And so I borrow a lot of private money from individuals, from either their investment capital or their retirement accounts. But I also enjoy the other part of the business, and that is I am a private lender myself to real estate investors. I've got my retirement funds in a self-directed IRA. And I loan those funds out to other real estate investors. And here's why I do it. And here's why 48 of mine and Carol Joy's private lenders loan money to us. There's three big reasons why someone would enjoy being a private lender, loaning money to real estate investors. Number one, we as private lenders are going to earn high rates of return that we probably can't get anywhere else. For example, right now, I'm paying out to private lenders and I'm receiving from real estate investors 8%, 8% interest, uh, interest only payments. And, you know, <laughs> as of today, the USA Today comes out every Thursday with um, a report as to the national average that certificates of deposit are paying right now, zero, zero point nine zero percent. That's less than one percent. So, you know, when you come along and offer a private lender eight times or more than eight times, but they can get in a CD that gets attention, right? So that's number one, earn a lot of money. 
Number two, it is safe and secure. And what I mean by that is, as real estate investors, we do not borrow unsecured funds. All the loans are collateralized by real estate. So it's secure and it's safe because it's a conservative loan to value. We don't borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value of a property. So that gives a large equity cushion to the private lender. Thirdly, the loan amount, the principal loan amount is not volatile. In other words, the value of that loan or investment does not lose any of its principal value. What we mean by that is there's no fees or commissions or any kind of cost that come out of the principal loan amount. And, and so, you know, the lender, the private lender knows exactly what the rate of return is going to be without wondering is any other uh, principal loan amount of the value going to reduce. What I'm doing is I'm contrasting this world of private money to investing in the stock market. So, you know, if you invest in the stock market, you already lost money because of fees and commissions and the principal amount can go down. All right. So in this program, nothing comes out of the principal. There's a fourth reason, Chaffee, for uh, people to be private lenders. And that is, it's for those people that want to be involved in real estate, but they don't want to do the work. <laughs> All right. They don't want to be, they want to be out finding deals, locating deals. They don't want to be overseeing any kind of repairs or renovations if they're needed. They don't want to be finding buyers. They just want to receive checks. So I love that part as a private lender. I do nothing except sit back, let checks arrive back in my self-directed IRA and it grows on automatic. So there's four reasons. Yeah, those are great reasons, Jay, especially uh, for a lot of people, that last one, I think all 48 of your private lenders have nothing to do with real estate because they love what they're currently doing, either with their job or retirement or something else, and they can enjoy the benefits of real estate and not do anything. <laughs> That's right. I mean, literally, it's not doing anything. I mean, like, you know, my private lenders, when they loan me funds, loan me money to do a deal, if it's coming out of their retirement account, all they do is one thing. They sign a document uh, with their self-directed IRA company, which is called a direction of investment. They sign it. It's electronic now. And they're done. They sign a document. And I mean, I mean, I don't want to sound cheesy, but it's the truth. It's like printing money for these private lenders. They sign a document and they receive and they receive funds on automatic. So it's, it's, you know, and you know, I teach my students all across the nation to do what I do. And that is when you're borrowing money from the private lender, I don't want my private lender to have to do anything, make it simple. I mean, you know, we take care of getting the promissory note and the uh, mortgage prepared by the real estate attorney. And you know, the private lender's not involved in all that. That's all being taken care of behind the scenes where all they got to do is sign a document and receive money, you know, knowing exactly what they're going to get. So that brings up a good question, Jay, uh, and another one that was brought up at the boot camp, which is, uh, what is the average age of the private lender that you work with? Is Do you have to be a particular age, either, you know, above or below a certain age to be a private lender? That's a uh, interesting question, and I'll tell you why. I haven't taken off 48 lenders and gotten their ages and added it all together and divided it by 48 <laughs> to see what the actual average age is. But I'll tell you something interesting. I've got private lenders. I got two private lenders that are minors. They are under the age of 18. And how that came about is their parents were already private lenders with me. And the two children's grandparent passed away, left money in the will, this liquid capital to the grandchildren. So the parents reached out to me who were already my private lenders and said, hey, can our children loan you money and participate in your private lending program? And I said, yes. And so all we did is the real estate attorney, my real estate attorney took care of it. They are minors, so they can't sign any legal documents. So the parents establish the accounts in the grandchildren's names and the parents sign the document on behalf of the children. So I got minors. 
I've got I've, I've got elderly uh, private lenders that are in their late 80s. I've got a lot of them in their 80s. I got one right now. Next birthday is turning 90 years old. But I get the question. I get the question. So I would say the majority of the private lenders have either just retired or they have already retired or they're in their 40s and 50s. Okay, so if somebody's going to use investment capital, you know, one common trend is they are entrepreneurs. And particularly if they're using their investment capital, you pretty much don't see many people walking around loaning out money just for investment capital unless they have an entrepreneurial spirit or they are up the food chain in a high managerial, you know, type position or principal of a company. So entrepreneurs, you know, well-to-do people. And then you got, you know, millions of people. The last number I heard, Chaffee, is I think right now on average, and I may be off on this a little bit, but I'm close. Somewhere around 10,000 people are retiring a day in the United States. So that's 10,000 new potential private lenders per day that, you know, could be doing with us, uh, could be doing business with us as, um, as um, you know, private lenders for us. So in answer to that question, one way to answer that question is don't rule out anybody. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're seeking private money, they may not have private cap, private lending capital, but you don't know who they know, right? So we teach at my boot camp how to get the word out and how to get your private lending program out very, very quickly to a mass number of people. So anyway, that was a long answer on a very narrow question. So hopefully I gave some content and, and information there that, you know, helps everybody out. Yeah, I, I think uh, you, you hit the nail on the head when you say it basically, you know, you shouldn't assume anything when you're meeting people. Just spread your program out. Tell, tell people about the program and let them decide whether it's for them or not. So exactly. you assume something, you might miss out on somebody and not be able to raise, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars because you assume they didn't have anything. Yeah. And I tell you, Chappie, I want to say this for the benefit of all of our viewers and listeners that have not tuned into this show before. And that is, this is not about chasing or begging at all. In right. fact, I teach at the boot camp exactly how I have 48 private lenders, over $7 million in private money right now that I have deployed out on the street, uh, invested in our houses. And to this day, I've yet to ask anybody for money. I have never asked anybody for money. And, you know, I just make my program available. And those that have investment capital or retirement funds, and they hear about the program, they're going to raise their hand and want to hear more. And Jay, I think this, uh, this came up at uh, a previous boot camp. I think uh, one of your students actually raised a couple hundred thousand dollars from one of their tenants who was an elderly lady. Do you remember that? Mm, you got to remind me. You got to remind me. Well, it, uh, again, he didn't assume anything. He was looking to raise private money. And one of his tenants who was an elderly retired lady actually had retirement funds, a couple hundred thousand dollars of retirement funds. And he was just there collecting rent and he shared the program with her. And she's like, Oh, I got some money. And you would never expect it because she's renting from him, one of his tenants, and she's retired. He's like, I didn't think she had any money, only it didn't, again, you know, he just followed the process, right? Didn't, didn't make an assumption, just shared the system. And she's like, I want to be a part of that. So raised a couple hundred thousand dollars from her, from his own yeah. tenant. <laughs> you know, as, uh, as you were telling the story, I do remember it now because I remember when I, I now remember when I first heard the story, I went. Wow, if that doesn't emphasize the point of, you know, don't, you know, sometimes the people that look like they got money are broke, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and sometimes people that look like they don't, they couldn't rub two pennies together, you know, you just don't know what's going on. So, in fact, I have a perfect example of that, Chavi. This was probably five years ago or so. My office man, excuse me, not my office manager, my bookkeeper. My lead bookkeeper, no, this was seven years ago, seven years ago, Chaffee, doesn't matter. 
but my lead bookkeeper in my office, of course, knows what I do, right? She's my lead bookkeeper. But she, but she really, she really didn't know what this private money thing was. So I'm just talking one day in the hallway about how the program works. Right? I mean, she knew I had private lenders, of course, and she knew that the, well, you know, the checks that were going out, et cetera. But she didn't know how the program worked. And so she says, Jay, how's this private lending program work, you know, that you're doing? And so I laid the program out to her. Bear in mind, her office was two doors down from mine in my hallway in my own company, right? And so I explained to her how the program works, you know, in a nutshell. You can explain it in three minutes or less in a conversation. And she says, I got somebody that I got a friend of mine that I think would really be interested in your program. I said, great. And so she walked away and I said, duh. I mean, how often is what you have to offer right under your nose. So, I mean, there's an example of me. I mean, I'm the private money authority and here's a lady working in my own office, two doors down that hadn't even heard my private lending program. And I'd already been doing it at that time for three years, you know? So anyway, sometimes you just can't see, what is that, the forest for the woods or something like that. Brings up a great book. I know it's a little off topic, Jay, only the book that uh, you just reminded me of is a book called Acres of Diamonds. I don't know if you heard of that book. I've and, heard of the book. I've heard of the book, but I haven't read it. It's been around a while, hasn't it? It's been around for a long time. It talks exactly what you're saying is that, you know, there's a farmer who had this plot of land and he heard about diamonds, found people finding diamonds, and he traveled the entire world looking for diamonds. And couldn't find it at all, came back to his farm and decided to sell the farm and retire. Turns out the person that bought the farm ended up finding acres of diamonds on the farmland itself. Do you know what, Chavi? Do you know what? Let me tell you why I knew I'd heard of the book, but I haven't read the book. So the most transformational book that I had read up until I was 24 years old. And it's still, I, I give it credit. I give the author credit for just transferring my life when I had hit really, literally rock bottom when I was 24 years old. My world was so messed up. And I won't get into that detail right now. But anyway, I was looking for a better way. And so I came across Og Mandino's book, University of Success. And in his book, of course, there's 52 lessons one lesson a week, and one lesson was based on uh, that book, Acres of Diamonds, and uh, I remember reading that chapter for that week, and so when you said it, I knew it sounded familiar, familiar, even though I hadn't actually read the book, I got the synopsis of it and the takeaways from uh, Ogmandino's University of Success, so you're right, thank you for bringing that up. Both very good books, definitely, uh, if the listeners haven't read it, go out and get them and read them. So uh, let's move on with the questions, though, Jay. And uh, let's continue on this theme about private lenders. We talked about the average age of your private lender. One of the questions that came up is if your private lender is a senior citizen, and unfortunately something happens and they pass away before they get paid, how do you deal with that? How do you handle that? Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. In fact, I remember that question being, that specific question being asked at the uh, live event. So I just had that question asked of me about a month ago from one of my elderly private lenders. He says, Jay, how can I make sure my estate is taken care of in the case of my demise while my notes are still open from you and you're still making payments? And so here's what I recommend to all my private lenders. Of course, if, you know, if the will is, by the way, everybody should have a will. And if you don't have a will, your state has got a will for you. And I promise you, you don't want it, right? So anyway, in the will, in all likelihood, and by the way, Chaffee, I'm not an attorney. So, you know, put that out there. But my understanding from my attorney is that, if you have a will in place, even if you don't specifically notate and say that you want the, these, these assets, and you know, a note is an asset, right? 
an accounts receivable, a notes and asset. If you don't have them specifically assigned, then they're just going to go to the estate at large. So what's much better is for whenever a private lender has notes, they're receiving payments from the real estate investor, they should specifically have it stated in the will who in the will is getting those assets in the case of death. So that's the answer. The best thing to do is for the private lender to have it specifically stated in the will who the, who receives the notes, those uh, private lender notes in the case of their death. Okay, so they would have to consult their attorney and basically update their will to make sure that that clause is in there somewhere. Correct. Awesome. So let's let's flip that uh, question uh, upside down. And another question that popped up was, well, Jay, you know, what happens if something happens to you and you're, you're the one that's making the payments? Exactly. Excellent question. So there's two ways to answer the question. And there's and what I mean by two different ways, there's two different scenarios. All right. So in the case of my death, if I were to die, and of course, I'm the, I'm the uh, managing member of my LLC that holds these properties. If I die, my will states that the trustee has got, of course, I'm not talking about the beneficiaries of my will, I'm talking about the trustee. And the trustee in my case is my real estate attorney. What better trustee should I have for my will than my real estate attorney? Because that's where most of my assets and my holdings are. So he has the instructions to liquidate the properties, okay? And for all those rent to own buyers that we have in place, if they have not exercised their option by the time the term expires on the uh, lease options, then they are to move and find another place to live if they haven't exercised their option and liquidate the properties. Now, there's another way to handle this. You, as the real estate investor, you can have a specific insurance policy for the purpose of, in the case of your death, in the event of your death, that insurance policy is then placed to pay off all the private lenders. So in the case of your death, all the private lenders get paid off by this specific insurance policy. And now your estate has all these properties free and clear. So two different ways. I like free and clear, Jay. <laughs> free and clear. Well, you'd really like it if you were in the will, okay? <laughs> um, well, hey, let's move on because I, I don't like talking about all this death stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, lo I'm looking at the clock and I think our show got, has got room for one more question in this episode. Okay, well, this is you brought up uh, some of your lease option tenants. So, you know, just a quick question about lease option tenants that popped up, which is, do you refer your lease option tenants to a particular loan broker or brokerage uh, when they purchase your property or uh, do they typically choose their own? Wow. I'm glad that question was asked because that is critically important. So let's step back for a moment and paint the picture why that question is so important. Just to reiterate, as you being the real estate investor, should you have a relationship with a local loan officer or mortgage brokerage uh, that you refer your rent to own buyers to, or do you leave them to, you know, choose their own? So here's the deal. On this rent to own process, first of all, I want to have a relationship with a mortgage broker or some company that can run debt ratios and housing ratios and verify income before I even let them move in the house. Why do I want somebody to move in if, you know, we're setting them up for failure to even cash out? So the answer to the question is yes. You definitely want to have a relationship with a mortgage lender, broker, loan officer. And in most cases, you're going to want to have a relationship with that person or company that specializes in VA, FHA, and USDA mortgages because Across the country, when you do this business, when it comes to cash out and you getting paid off and, and the new homeowner or the rent-to-own owner actually having that deed or title in their name, 
that's most of the mortgages that are going to be used, either FHA, USDA, or VA. So here's the bottom line. These people moving in on rent to own, they moved in to begin with because they needed your help on this way to home ownership. You know, right now, nearly 80% of the people in the United States can't go to the bank or mortgage company and get approved for a mortgage to buy a house. So when they come to you looking for a way to move towards ownership, you are the answer. You are the person that has the pieces and the process in place to move them to the consummation of owning the home. So the bottom line is it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen for them unless you have a relationship to refer them to in your rent to own process. Secondly, I want to know what's going on with the mortgage. If they, I mean, what's their mortgage ready? If they've got their own relationship, then, you know, I'm not going to know what's going on. But the main thing is if you want to move towards a uh, cash out now, you know, I've got colleagues in this business that have no interest in moving towards cash out. They just want to receive the non-refundable option fee and leave the buyers or rent to own buyers to their own devices, knowing that it's probably not going to happen. And either model is not better than the other. It's just a business decision. What do you want to do? And if your desire is to move to cash out, yes, you need that relationship with the uh, mortgage company. Well, OJ, you know, one thing that I like about working with you and what you teach your students and how you operate your business is that, yes, it's it's a business decision whether you want to help your tenant buyer cash out or not. And what I can say is that you always lead with your heart, right? You always lead with a servant's heart wanting to help people out. So not only do you hook them up with a mortgage broker to help them cash out because that's what you want them to do is you want to help them obtain this property that they've paid you money as a down payment to do. Um, You're not looking just from the money and the business side, you're looking to really help people with this. And so not only do you hook them up with mortgage broker, you even help them with credit repair if that's the case as well, correct? Absolutely. Which tells me perhaps we should do an episode sometime that teaches our uh, audience how to locate a mortgage broker that you want to work with. (laughs) Because I trust you, you don't want to work with all of them. There's specific criteria that I teach on how to locate that mortgage broker. Well, Chaffee, thank you so much for joining me here on another show of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I appreciate it so much. It was awesome, of course, having you at the event last week. You're always with me. And we told people if time permitted, we were going to give them some highlights of what happens at the event, but we're out of time. So, folks, you got to get on over to www.jayconner.com, all lowercase, forward slash money podcast, and check it out. Chabby, thank you so much. And, folks, here's to taking your business to the next level. I'm Jay Conner, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. God bless you. Love you all. And we'll see you on the next upcoming show. Bye-bye.